opening of epoxides is a seemingly simple reaction that can catch you by surprise if you are not paying attention to the conditions and the reagents you are working with. Hello everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and in this video I want to talk about the epoxide opening in both acidic and basic conditions. So grab your cup of coffee and notebook to work through the examples with me, hit that like button for good luck on the test and let's get started. As I've mentioned a moment ago, epoxides can be opened in both acidic and basic conditions. The main difference between the two approaches is going to be the regioselectivity of the reaction. And by regioselectivity here I mean which side we are going to open our epoxide ring from. So, if for instance I look at an epoxide, it is going to be a three-membered ring with an oxygen atom in the ring. We also call epoxides oxyranes, which is the IUPAC name for the functional group. If the molecule is not symmetrical, we can distinguish between the more and the less substituted sides of the ring. Now, depending on the nature of our reagents and conditions, the ring can be opened from either the more substituted side or from the less substituted side. TLDR version here is that the acidic conditions open our epoxides from the more substituted side, while the basic conditions open the epoxides from the less substituted side. Now, let's talk about the details of why that happens and how. I'm going to start by looking at the epoxide opening in the acidic media. In acidic conditions, we'll have strong acids like H2SO4 present as a catalyst or the reagent itself will be a strong acid, like for instance something like HBr or HI. So, for instance, if I look at my example molecule, which is going to be a 2,2-dimethyl oxyrane here, then if I treat that with something like HBr, then I get the product in which the oxygen will be attached to the less substituted carbon of what used to be our epoxide ring, and the bromine will be connected to the more substituted carbon. Now, mechanistically speaking, this reaction is going to start by protonating the oxygen of our epoxide, which is going to be followed by the ring opening by the nucleophilic bromide anion. And interestingly enough, although this is a tertiary atom, the reaction seems to follow the SN2 kinetics. And if any stereochemistry, any relevant stereochemistry is present, we'll see the inversion of the stereochemistry here as well. Occasionally, we'll see the formation of the carbocation in reactions like that, but those are not all too common. And even though there is a possibility of a carbocation formation here, we'll treat this reaction as a special case of the SN2, which works for tertiary carbons for whatever weird reason. We'll also attribute this unusual reactivity to the ring strain, because it's a three-membered ring, all of a sudden it violates uh, our regular rules. So, as you can understand, that is a little bit of an oversimplification but it works for the purposes of our class here. Now, I've mentioned that we'll also see the inversion of the stereochemistry here. Indeed, if I took, let's say, this molecule and treated that with HBr, the resulting product will have a carbon with the opposite stereo configuration. You can confirm that we do see the inversion here by assigning the stereo descriptors to our chiral atoms. The molecule on the left is going to have the S stereo descriptor, or in in other words, it is the S stereoisomer, while the product in this reaction has the R stereo configuration. And by the way, using this opportunity, I'm going to remind you that the inversion of the stereo configuration does not always coincide with the change in the stereo descriptor. It works in most cases, yes, but it does depend on the nature of the living group and the nucleophile itself. And occasionally, you'll end up with the same stereo descriptor for both starting material and the product in your reaction, because the CIP priorities can get all switched around uh, with a new group coming into the molecule. And of course, here is the mechanism for this reaction. Pause this video if you need a few moments to look at it, or maybe copy it down. Well, what if my reagent is not a strong acid on its own? What am I going to do then? Well, in the cases like that, we'll need to bring acid as a catalyst. 
Since we don't want any competition between our conjugate base and the nucleophile that we have in our system, we'll use non-nucleophilic acids like H2SO4 for our catalyst. So, for instance, here, if I go back to my 2,2-dimethyl oxirane and treat it with methanol, for instance, nothing is going to happen on its own. The methanol molecule is not nearly acidic enough to protonate my epoxide and make it more reactive. And on its own, methanol is a poor nucleophile. But as soon as I have my H2SO4 as a catalyst, this reaction becomes possible. The catalyst here, my H2SO4, provides the acidic protons that will enable this reaction to happen. So we'll protonate our oxirane or our epoxide first, and then we'll have our methanol, which is a poor nucleophile, attack our oxirane or our epoxide ring, if you like. And in this case, the fact that methanol is a poor nucleophile doesn't matter as much, because now our epoxide is activated, it is uh, protonated, so it's significantly more reactive. So, in this case, like in previous examples, the attack happens from the more substituted side, and after the final proton transfer for my uh, last protonated intermediate here, I'm going to get the final product that looks like this. Here, like in all these examples, our nucleophile ends up on the more substituted carbon of what used to be an epoxide. Now, moving on to the opening of our epoxide in basic conditions, I want to mention right away that it is not always actually the basic conditions. I suppose it is called this way to drive the point and maybe emphasize the attention on the differences in the conditions, and it's kind of easy to remember acid versus base, acidic conditions versus basic conditions, but in reality it should have been called more like the epoxide opening with a strong nucleophile or something like that instead. Yes, it doesn't sound nearly as good as acidic versus basic conditions, but it is more correct version this way. The thing is, while some nucleophiles are indeed bases, many are not. So, for instance, if I treat my good old friend 2,2-dimethyl oxirane with potassium cyanide, then we are going to have cyanide, which is indeed in a nucleophile. But is it a base? Well, not at all. Cyanide is completely non-basic. And another important distinction here is that the strong nucleophiles are going to open our epoxides from the less substituted side. And it doesn't matter whether it's a base or not a base. So, mechanistically speaking, the reaction is your typical SN2 process that going to prioritize the less substituted side of the ring. The nucleophile, the cyanide anion in this case, going to attack the carbon, uh, breaking our carbon-oxygen bond and making an alkoxide intermediate, which then going to quickly grab the proton from the solvent, giving us the final product. And yes, our nucleophile can be a base as well. Like, for instance, in this case, if I were to treat our friend 2,2-dimethyl oxirane with a solution of sodium methoxide in methanol, then in this case, I'm going to get the methoxide attack the epoxide from the less substituted side as well, because it is a nucleophile, and it so happens that it is also a base. And as we know from all of our previous organic chemistry studies, alkoxides are fairly basic. Does it matter that the methoxide is a base, though? No, not really. Unless, of course, you have some sort of acidic functional groups in your molecule that can participate in a proton transfer. Other than that, the fact that it's a base is completely irrelevant. What does matter, though, is that the methoxide is a good nucleophile. And since the world of nucleophiles is really diverse, we'll have a plethora of possible products that we can make by opening epoxides with different nucleophiles. And what's really cool is that they all will open epoxides from the less substituted side, making this reaction a powerful tool in our synthetic arsenal. But that's a topic for a different tutorial. So if you don't want to miss that one, make sure you subscribe to the channel for daily organic chemistry updates, boop the like button to help promote this video, watch this video next to learn more awesome organic chemistry stuff, and I will see you tomorrow!